know me better than I know myself, and you've known me longer than anyone else. Such knowledge is too wonderful. Understand it. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I can't even comprehend it. But I know you see. the depths where I could make my bed But I never went high and see You're so good at finding me Only lost in the mystery Of the depth of your love Your hand will hold me still Even where Even where my world is shaking Your hand will hold me still I'm fearfully Good evening and welcome to Sundays with Sylvia. Now, it's plain to see I am not Sylvia. I am the previous invisible man. So Sylvia has taken a back seat this evening. I am in the anchor position and we also have Sharon with us. So would you two please say hello to the saints? Hello, this is... This is the normal person that's sitting in the seat. 
is now taking a back seat. And that's that's my honor to be able to present the seat that I normally sit in to my good friend Richard Krupa. And we love seeing the invisible man becoming visible. Oh mm. my goodness. I'm undone. <laughs> But tonight, we're going to continue in John chapter 5. It's, we're going as fast as we can. We only have an hour this evening, but there's a lot to it. And it seems like the more you delve into the scriptures, there's more to discover and uncover. So there's always more. The Spirit always shows us more. So, allow me to read just a few verses, and we will comment on them. And we're in John chapter 5, verse 31. Jesus speaking, he says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Ye said unto ye, ye sent unto John, meaning John the Baptist, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, and bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. So this is, this is a little episode in this chapter 5, and it speaks of four witnesses. John the Baptist, the works that Jesus did, the Father, and last but not least, the Scriptures, four witnesses. And, and John, of course, bore witness. And it's real interesting, and I think we should go to Matthew chapter 11, because there... Jesus brings up some interesting questions, and this particular passage of Scripture in Matthew answers some of the questions that Jesus was talking about in John chapter 5. So, let, allow me to read some of the Scriptures, and we're going we're gonna to start in chapter Matthew chapter 11 at verse 2. And probably read up to verse 12. So bear with me while I read some of the scriptures. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and sent, said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go, and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And so they departed, went back to John. Jesus began saying unto the multitude concerning John, All right, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what ye went out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses, but what went ye for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, 
Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not been, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, I'm going to allow some commentary here, but one thing I want to bring out is just like John the Baptist, it seems like a, a pastoral scene out in the wilderness, this curious, queer-looking man, the way he was dressed and what he was preaching. You got to realize that probably for about 400 years, God was silent regarding the nation of Israel. There was just silence from heaven. Now, this man comes along, John the Baptist, and starts shaking things up. <clears throat> and so Jesus asks a good question. What do you go out there to see it for? What are you looking for? What do you want to hear? How is this man going to impact you if you do hear him? And the thing is, the fullness, we've got to realize that the fullness of time has come that the Son of God in a Son of Man has come to earth and is has kicked the anthill, so to speak. He is stirring things up, and now the kingdom of God is beginning to suffer violence, literally, because by this time there has been a number of assassination attempts on Jesus' life. Here is, with John coming on the scene, and now Jesus is a clash of the titans. The clash of two kingdoms vying for the souls of men, vying for this piece of real estate that we call earth. And it's going to get ugly. Well, <clears throat> first of all, if we there think we about John the Baptist. I mean, probably the prophets never looked like anybody else in your neighborhood anyway. But this man came out, had been in the wilderness. And, God, and the word of God came to John in the, in the wilderness. Now, why was he in the wilderness anyway? He was, <clears throat> God took him into the wilderness because his life would have been threatened. The devil real, knew probably that John the Baptist was really the true priest. It wasn't Caiaphas. John the Baptist was. And so any of these legal mm. people like John the Baptist and like Jesus was the legal right to the throne, the throne of David. Interesting enough, the devils knew that and right. they said it. But right. you see, the men didn't. But here, John the Baptist, radical looking, unshaved you know, man that in, in skins, really. A real departure. Yes, a real departure. Yes. And coming out of the of the wilderness. Now he's calling people to repentance. Yes. Don't, no, none of us can really be introduced to Christ without repentance, really. And now he's radical. He's not some soft little preacher. He is radical because in Ju in Luke, he says in, in chapter 3, verse 7, multitude that came forth to be baptized of him. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? In other yes. words, this is serious business. Yes. Preparing the way of Christ, the Savior. Preparing the heart, the heart that is still, you know, trusting in themselves, trusting in Judaism, trusting in, yes. you know, all yeah. that they had trusted in. You see, in themselves, basically, and in their religion, you see, which is, it's, these are idol, actually, they're worshiping their religion as an idol, really. And so he calls it what it is. He's right. not mincing words, right. you know, because make 
make way, repent. That is what he's saying. Yes. I mean, that's a, that's an unusual word these <clears throat> days. We don't even hear words like this. But repent, in other words, change your mind, change your ways, change what you're thinking about the truth. What is the real truth? Now, the Savior is coming, and he, will, he is the truth. Hear he, him. See, you brought up a good point. We don't hear that word repent today. They didn't hear it back then either, not before John. That's right. They were settled in their feast days, their rituals, their false sacrifices that were only made acceptable by faith. The temple was a false temple. It was it was illegitimate in that the glory, the Shekinah glory, was not dwelling in Herod's temple. So this is this is a paradigm shift in the the paradigm shift is the kingdom of God is at hand. That's right. People thought that they they already were in the kingdom of God. Right. And they're exposed that actually they are not in the kingdom of God. Actually, he says you're of your father the devil later on. <laughs> Right. Uh, John chapter 8 gets real clear about that. And like you said, Sylvia, Jesus, he speaks to them where they a lot of times don't understand because they're not asking the right questions, but Jesus has the answers that they need to know. So, Things get violent. Um, we read how that they take up stones to stone him, and they're not concerned about the works that he does for the works. Those works, we don't stone you, but that you say you're the Son of Man. And I'll go back to verse 27 in chapter 5. And this is, I think, one critical point that was a flashpoint with the Jews. And we've we've spoken this verse before in our previous sessions here in chapter five. But this is where this is where it gets right to the heart of the matter. And Jesus was explaining that the Father hath given him, Jesus, authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. Jesus, Norman Grubb, in his little booklet, The Key to Everything, spoke that Jesus proclaimed himself the Son of God like five times, but the Son of Man some 55 times. That's the whole idea. That's the whole gospel. That's the whole heart of God. That is, that has kicked up this whole animosity and violence that the kingdom of God now suffers, particularly Jesus in particular, because he is the kingdom of God personified, and he was all by himself. He was an easy target, although they, it wasn't his time. They could never actually do violence to him until till his time was truly come. That's right. I, I've been saying something kind of radical lately um, <clears throat> because of sometimes I have people called Jehovah Witnesses that come to my door. Right. And I, I've been saying Jehovah cannot save you. Hmm. God the Father cannot save you. That's a pretty radical thing to say, really. But it really fits with what you, you're just you're talking about, that Jesus had to be the Son of Man. He had to see that's the crux of it. It is. That it did God become in human form. Was God made human in the in the form of Jesus Christ? See, that's the crux of it today. Anything else is antichrist. Anything else is antichrist. We're hearing that yes. if you if you say 
if you cannot say that God came in human flesh, then yes. you're, it's the spirit of Antichrist. Yes. And so why is that so important? Well, it's so important because God, Jesus Christ had to, had to come in the form of man because he was the second Adam. He had to undo everything that the first Adam, the original man, did at the fall. He had yes. to undo it all. And uh, uh, he could not come just as a spirit. He had to have human flesh and blood. And, uh, and that's why in Rome, in Hebrews chapter 2, it says he's not ashamed to call us his brothers because he's been tempted in every way, yet without sin, just like us, even right. though we were born sinners and he never sinned, but yet he was tempted in every way. So it's how this is the crux of what makes Jesus different is because he's God in human form. And without that, we're all lost. If God did not come, because this, the, the, the Father, the beauty of the Father, he, Jesus said about the Father to the woman on the, at, at the well that mm. God is spirit. Yes. And we must worship <clears throat> him in spirit and truth. And so God the Father sent mm. his Son the only way that we could be saved and, and came and born in human flesh. I mean, it's huge, you all. It's huge. So we've got John the Baptist as a witness. Also, we have the works that Jesus did and continues to do even today through his sons and daughters. We have that those as a witness that Jesus is indeed the Christ. He says in verse 36 of chapter 5, he says, But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do. And they bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. So it's real curious that back in Matthew 11, John sends a deputation of a couple of his disciples to Ask Jesus directly, please, Jesus, speak plainly. Just answer the question. Don't dance around. Well, Jesus danced around. He said, go back and tell John. Shh, tell, him, tell him of the works that I did. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. The, the dead are raised. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. So Jesus answered the question truly and comprehensively, and he did indeed speak plainly. Mm -hmm. He did. I mean, Richard, if we think about it, you said the temple did not any longer have God's glory. Right. And that's right, because after 70, after uh, the first temple was destroyed, Nebuchadnezzar you know, just had three sieges that came down on Jerusalem. Yes. And the, and the I think Josephus says that Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant. And so even when they came back after, after 70 years, there was no glory in the Holy of Holies. Right. So we wonder, when will the glory come back? And so, you know what? The Jews were wondering this. They were wondering this. All right. Now, what... I think John uh, uh, that he uh, that Jesus is talking about to tell John the Baptist, look, I'm demonstrating God's glory because the glory of God's in me. Yes. And I'm 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 giving these I'm healing these people through the glory of God. Right. The glory of God has returned, but it's come come in human form in right. me. Right. Right. Not in buildings made with hands and constructs. No, human flesh. Right, human flesh, visible. And let's go on to the witness of the Father. In verse 37 and 38, Jesus says, And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Now this is the interesting part. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. 
and ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. So, as Sylvia pointed out earlier, the Father could not save us. The Father is Spirit. The Holy Spirit can't save us. There's one unique characteristic and personage of the entire Godhead, and that was the man, Jesus Christ. The Father, you, um, excuse me, um, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. The Father is spirit. Now, as to hearing his voice, hmm, there's some debate about that because if you all recall, when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Some said it thundered. Some said, God is tricksy. <laughs> the only way you are going to apprehend God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and their ways is by faith, is by faith. It's not by a voice out of heaven. It's by faith and that of the Son of God himself. Mm -hmm. Faith is a gift. Everything we receive is a gift. The three of us are privileged to sit here and be speaking of these things and and sharing with you as well, because we we have received grace upon grace. We receive life. Christ is our life. We don't have life in and of ourselves. We are not autonomous, self-generating beings. Christ is our life. He's the vine. We're the branches. We could go on and on about that. Yeah, we could. <laughs> Richard, could you say a little bit more about this, the, what you're saying, Christ is our life, in contrast to he's the tree and we're the branches? Could you say something more mm. about that? It's a source, isn't it? It's a living source, a living life that's being, um, that we're receiving. Right. And that makes it our life, but right. it's Christ coming through us. Right. Curious thing about that, <clears throat> now that you bring that up, in evangel evangelistic terms, I became a Christian uh, some 50 years ago under the auspices of the little Four Spiritual Laws booklet put out by Campus Crusade for Christ. And they always, if I recall correctly, you were encouraged to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And I thought, well, well, actually, that's what I did. I literally got down on my knees at the right time. I kicked against the goads for a while, but finally I made a deliberate conscious decision to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. But following that, maybe a couple, three years ago, I was always curious about the word received, because really it doesn't specifically say that in the Bible, that you've got to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But nonetheless, the principle is true. We have nothing but what we didn't receive it from the one and only source in the universe, and that source that's not the correct word to use. God is, is the all of the universe. And everything that is, I mean, we could go to right at the beginning of the, the Gospel of John. Everything that came into being, came into being by the word of God. So we do receive. We, we just, it's a receiving life. We live the life of another. That's what the gospel is. That's what, that's what we're speaking about. And so we're speaking also the witnesses that Jesus had, the witnesses that we generate and have. 
And you know what? I'm thinking about in the book of Isaiah, it talks about that Jesus himself was a branch out of the root of Jesse. Oh, gosh, yes. So if he's a branch, it's talking about his humanity there. Yes. It's talking about, and then next verses also then start talking about his the anointed one or the Christ mm, who was yes. an anointed man, really. Yes. A man that came out of the root of Jesse, which is David's father. So, But he's called a branch, you yes. see? He's yes. called the branch. And this, so it's saying that God was going to come in human form, and this human was going to be wholly anointed with the glory of God and the wisdom of God, mm. <laughs> you see? So right there in the Old Testament, it's saying it many, many times. But you see, the Jews missed it because, you know, <laughs> interesting, interesting, and Christians miss it today. Why do Christians miss it, that he really was a human being just like us, this, have the same feelings, the same temptations, the same thing? Well, because we want to make him so God that he could just flip, you know, the, the Pharisees off he didn't really and come up with his own memorized answers or some kind of rote thing. You, so you see, no, 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 no. He was human, and he had to live from, you're talking about the source, which yes. is the power and the wisdom from God. Right. From, he had to live from that. He himself was a branch, and he had to live from that and be totally human. Now, why did the Jews hate that? Well, I'll tell you why Christians hate it today, because Christians hate it today because we call our human flesh evil today we call we say about our own nature that we have an evil human nature and we do not realize that through the cross of christ that he we we were crucified with him and crucified yes. and he died to yes. that old nature and resurrected his life within us you see as his life and therefore our bodies our humanity is also a branch that can do nothing. And, yes. and instead of telling the branches to do better, work harder, you know, do do this, do that, you see, even Jesus did not operate that way. Oh he, he's saying right in this chapter, of my human self, right. I can do nothing. So, so why then do we hate our humanity? Because we do not understand it. The point is, what is man? Man is a precious vessel of the living God and we beat it up and we hate it because we think it's not performing correctly and we do not understand we have a whole nother new created realm which is a God eternal realm within us which is Christ himself really that is our life. Interesting <clears throat> I think we would all agree that man is the highest creation the highest created being short of the Godhead itself. And, but remember when the disciples were showing Jesus around the Temple Mount and, you know, the look there, Jesus, the glorious buildings and gleaming. You really had to have sunglasses to look at it on a sunny, sunny day, literally. <clears throat> and everybody could accept that. And it was it was an empty temple. It was it was, like we said earlier, an illegitimate temple. It was a government funded temple, as a matter of fact, Amen. and and it did not contain the glory. It was a beautiful edifice. There was glory in the shape of it and the architecture and all of that. And that people just fell over each other. In ooing and eyeing at the beauty of the temple. But then when it comes to living temple, like the prophets spoke about, clearly spoke about a temple not made with hands. I will write my laws on your heart, not on tablets of stone put away in a 
big cabinet where nobody could see them. We are the glorious temple. Amen. <laughs> Way more better than as glorious as Herod's temple seemed to be, didn't hold a candle to the true living heartbeat, breathing, throbbing consciousness, having the mind of Christ temple that we who are the sons and daughters of God have. That's the Christ life. Speaking to, you know, further answer your question. That's the true living Christ life that we are privileged to live and whosoever will may live. Richard, um, we would much rather have things to worship. That's than, the trap. That's the trap than unseen things. Unseen things. We'd rather trust in the visible than the unseen things. And even Jesus doing all those miracles didn't convince these Pharisees at all. And actually, Jesus, after he said, tell John all this that I've done. Mm -hmm. But he says of the Pharisees, you all father, follow me for signs and wonders. <laughs> yes. You see? So right. he puts it down to them because, you know, John the Baptist needed to hear that. That, that was a weak point in his life. I mean, it was. There he was in prison. He was going to be beheaded. It was a weak point. And right. so out of weakness, he had to ask that question. Again, you would think, the great John the Baptist, didn't he know? Right. Yes, he knew. He knew, but yet there was that place of weakness that we all have. Yes. We all have. And it gave Jesus the opportunity to really say yes. when he said, what did you come out to see when John right. the Baptist came? Right. And actually, we could pose this question to each other and to why why do people tune in to us on Sunday evenings or look at the YouTube videos? What whom do you seek? And it's a good it's a good thing to give pause and consider these things every now and then. Who who are you looking for? What are you looking for? Are you looking for answers to questions of life? Or are you looking for the life, life itself? Good to think about mm -hmm. these things every now and then. Sure is. So the father was a witness to his son, Jesus. But also the scriptures, the scriptures Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye may have life. I receive not honor from man, from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. But wait a minute. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Let's stop there. So, it's always... you. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And it's true. And they are they which testify of me. But the scriptures are not the life. They testify of the life. And, and as good as the word is, it's to propel you into the living life of the Christ. Christ himself the scriptures speak not of themselves, but they point to the one only Son of God, Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself. And why would he kind of um, take issue with the scriptures at this point? 
one thing is because the Jews took the scriptures and made a complete construct of it. They interpreted, reinterpreted, thrashed them out. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they debated. The lawyers had their say in it. And the scriptures became this colossal construct of laws and rules and regulations and rituals that, by gosh, it took lawyers to interpretate every move. The scriptures, the word of God, in a sense, became corrupted. The scriptures lost their value. They lost their point, And they lost who they were pointing to. The scriptures themselves, to the Jews, became life to them. And by God, you better not break the scriptures. And that's why Jesus got into trouble all the time. Everything he did, oh, can't do it. It's a, it's a Sabbath. You can't, you can't abridge. You can't violate the Sabbath. So Jesus was always running smack into all these rules, regulations, and it proved that the scriptures are not life in themselves. Ye think that ye have eternal life, but you've got to realize the scripture, they testify this fourth witness and testimony. They speak of Jesus the Christ. Well, you know, even today we can read the scriptures and make them law. We, we can, can? Yes, we can. And as, as long as, personally, as long as I saw myself separate and not the truth of my oneness with Christ, yes, that he is my life, you see, then I made the scriptures law. So every time I would read them, I would, it would point back to what I wasn't doing right or what, what I could do, be doing right. And so, therefore, I had to somehow imitate and be right that way through the law. But, it, you know, that kind of life just binds us up. Now, this, in the very first chapter of John, it says that of his, is talking about Christ, of his fullness have we all received mm. from grace uh, for grace. Yes, yes. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Well, they were expecting a Messiah, but they thought the Messiah would just make what they were doing right and make the Romans who had invaded and, you know, had taken over the country, that they were the true enemy, not realizing that their own hearts were the true enemy. Yes. <laughs> not realizing that. And the way that they, they made what could have been even grace in the Old Testament, because Abraham... Abraham lived by faith, and he right. was reckoned to be righteous, mm, yes. the father of their faith. So they had him as an example. So then why was the law given in the first place? Well, it was given to make them guilty because they were all guilty before God. That's why. It's a schoolmaster to cause us to realize our guilt, not yes. our self-righteousness. Now, what they did that's with the, the reverse. That's the of reverse. what people think. That's yeah. right. It's the reverse. Mm. And what they did with the scriptures is become more and more and more self righteous, what we call the Pharisaical spirit, which we Christians can have too. And I certainly had mm. before I really realized my oneness with Christ, that He was my life, He was the law keeper within me. And, um, and so, therefore, I lived in the rest of that. You know, meaning that I could rest in him and know that he is the law keeper within me, and which is really the new covenant. Yes. But now you bring up an interesting point. This son of man issue, this flashpoint, this abrasive that just ground the gears of the Jews. Because they knew, just like you said, they were expecting a Messiah. And rightly so. I mean... Old Testament prophets prophesied they knew a Messiah was coming at some point. If a Messiah was coming, it had to be a man. 
So really, so what that tells me, they knew the Messiah had to come as a man, but not this kind of man. I think that's what ground their gears. Just like you said just a few moments ago about how that the Jews were wanting to this Messiah to whip the Romans and bring the kingdom of God on earth. And Jesus came saying, when he, when after he was back, the, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right around the corner. It's right now. But it sure didn't satisfy the Jews because it didn't look like the kingdom of God I think they were expecting. Well... Because they wanted him to prove their righteousness, which is was self-righteousness of the devil, <laughs> really. It wasn't. And, and so Jesus said, when they asked him, when will the kingdom come? He says, well, the kingdom of God is within you. They didn't want the kingdom of God within them. They didn't want to have to repent and come into uh. a new realm of the Holy Spirit at all. They wanted to be their self-righteous flesh selves you see, really, and in, in dwelt by Satan to build some kind of religious system, you see, that would and, and have a savior that would overcome and be some kind of champion that would justify them yes. and, 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 and slaughter the Romans. Yes. They were expecting a, a Messiah to certify them, yes. their religion, all their constructs, the law, and if he would have done that, no problems. Mm -hmm. No but problems. But he did the opposite. But he did the opposite. And actually, probably maybe at the rate we're going, maybe in January next year sometime, we'll get to chapter 8 of John because there's a passage there, just four or five verses, that really call things the way they are. And we're not going to go into it right now, but... Stay tuned when we get there. It's going to kick the ant hill some more. Yes. <laughs> and um, and but I will give you a hint. And we've spoken of it before. Um, John eight forty four, where ye are of your father the devil. Mm. So, but that Jesus again, like we said at the beginning of tonight's session that Jesus cut to the quick. He didn't mince words, neither did John the Baptist. And this was and is continuing to be and heading for a climax, the clash of two kingdoms and um, the flashpoint and things get settled at the cross. But we're not there yet. Well, I'm thinking about us today in Christianity. What actually saves us? Is it our prayer? Is it our Bible reading? Is it all the good things? Is the church going? Is the going to hear teachers? Is it is you know is it going to being in a particular denomination? You see, these are all things that can have that mental construct, just mm -hmm. like you said. Yes. In the Christian today, and we could be more legalistic than the Jews of old. We always think, you know. They were so, you know, we, we could see what Jesus says to them. Right. But what have we done in Christianity today? What have we idolized? What have we made idols and false? Because Jesus told the woman at the well, the only way you can really mm. and truly worship God yes. is in spirit and in truth, yes. not in a place. Yes. Not even in a, you know, and we were talking about this the other night with Sharon about, you know, the movie, The Prayer Closet. Yes. How that they that she found a closet and went into that closet and prayed. Well, I mean, and Richard, you brought this up. How many people then went and moved everything out of a closet to try to find God in the prayer closet? Right. We don't find God in a place. I mean, right. no, we find God inside of us. The right. kingdom of God is within us. Yes. I mean, he's... He, I mean, you can find him anywhere. Actually, most a lot of people find him more in the bathroom than anywhere. You know, taking a shower or whatever. Right. Really, because the holy, the speak, the speaking of the word within us is everywhere and anywhere. 
that's what we're saying. I like that, Sylvia, because what we're learning is how to listen. We're learning to listen to the Holy Spirit. Yes. And it's the Holy Spirit is present <clears throat> within us. That's a good definition, Sylvia. It's okay to go into your closet and do that and have quiet time. But the objective for me is spending time with the Lord, also listening and opening up to the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of God that's within. And you can do that walking down the street. You know, that's exactly. You right. can do that at TJ Maxx. <laughs> there you go. Been known to do it. <laughs> well, you all bring up excellent points because it's easy to look back in history in these gospel accounts. I mean, I've done it myself. I wouldn't be like those people. If I seen Jesus come, I, man, I'd I'd go to him. I'd see him. I'd believe in him. Oh, yeah? No. Christianity today, in many senses, has followed the same path as the legalistic Jews. Have built magnificent temples. They call them campuses now. Good. Um, All kinds of constructs many, a whole plethora of programs to fix and solve and debate, thrash out personal problems, all of it, all of it. You can go there as to a doctor's office to get healed and patched up, patted on the back. but you must come to Christ. It heals you only slightly. Anything less than Jesus Christ himself and his life and what he has promised falls short. Amen, brother. (laughs) So let's go on. Let's see. My gosh, Sylvia, we're about to go through this chapter. But Jesus says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, How shall ye believe my words? Boy, he cut to the quick right there, didn't he? He did. You didn't touch Moses. You didn't mess with Moses. Anybody messes with Moses, you're going to have to answer to the Jews. You don't, I'm going to, there's a phrase, you don't mess with mama. You don't mess with Moses. (laughs) Not when it comes to the Jews, you're going to have to answer to them, generally under penalty of death. Right. You go slandering Moses. Or Abraham. Oh, don't mess with Abraham. They're patriarchs. They made them gods, really. They They idolized them. And Jesus rightly says, if you really heard them, you would hear me. So you never really heard what they had to say or what they represented or how they spoke of me. Jesus is saying that. <laughs> I want to look up uh, Genesis 49.10. Ah, and it speaks. It says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And see, Jesus is the fulfillment of that scripture way back then, that just like like this scripture here says, For had ye believed Moses you would have certainly believed me. And so that's probably one reason he's always going on about if you have, if you just had ears to hear and eyes to see, 
but ye, ye refuse it. You will not, they say. Willfully, they will not. You see, by their will, they will not. See, I mean, even when he came up with the four witnesses, mm -hmm. it didn't prove anything to them. It didn't prove anything, you right. see. Because their, their God, the Father, was different, really. Their father was the devil and didn't even know it, you see. And so, and John the Baptist, they thought he was just wild man that came out of the wilderness, which he was, but they beheaded him. So, you see, they're cutting down every witness. And then even when he did the miracles, which was another witness, they, well, they argued you did it on the Sabbath day. You broke the law. And of your father, the, they accused him. Of being the devil. Yes. They did. So it didn't matter what kind of proof that that he actually had, which was the witness of the father, the witness that he had of all. Mm -hmm. And that's the same today. You know what? When you really know, the tr if you're truly born again of God's spirit and you're living by the life of another, like you said, you know, people, they will either, they'll hear what you have to say or they'll run from you or make you the devil or make you totally wrong or hate you, you see? And so if they knew, if because people of the same spirit love each other. Right, right. But people that are not of the spirit of God will always refuse you. They will, and they will make you wrong regardless of what you say or what how you try to prove it to them. Usually, it's really, it weakens you. I always told Sharon this. It always weakens you to even try to explain yourself because they're going to make you wrong anyway. That's exactly what they've done with Jesus here. They're making him wrong. He couldn't, I mean, there he was doing miracle raising people from the dead. Right. You know, I mean, and the and everybody knew that the power that he was preaching from they knew it. They heard his words, you know, like nobody else has the doctrines you have and right. the power of the spirit like you have. That didn't convince them. See, they want, they will not be con so willfully. They believed yes. not. And that's what gets us today. You bring up a good point. Willfully, they would not. <clears throat> now, and, and you bring up another good point because as we go along in John, we're going to see Lazarus raised from the dead. They could not refute it. They they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do with the the blind man, born blind from birth, and now he could see. So this brings up a prickly point, but we want to look behind the scriptures and behind the answers what Jesus how he addressed the Jews who was who was Jesus really speaking to now in in these gospel accounts he's this this is historical and it's true he's addressing the Jews his brethren but who was he really addressing so let's pull back the curtain, let's go behind the scenes and take a brief look in the few minutes we have left to see who was operating the Jews. Because, like you said, they weren't hearing. It didn't matter. The four witnesses, John the Baptist, didn't matter. The works didn't matter. They marveled at them and they benefited from them. The Father, we don't even want to hear about the Father and the scriptures, oh, we know the scriptures. They weren't having any of it. Why not? Who, who was driving them? Who doesn't want anything to do with the Son of God? And more to the point, who doesn't want anything to do with the Son of Man? Would you care to? Well, you already know. And I, do. I bet you... The people that are listening already know, too. If we pull back the veil, yes. behind the veil of their flesh was the devil himself. Yes. He was, that's the true enemy. And just yes. like Paul says in Ephesians, we don't war against flesh and blood. 
We mm. war really yes. against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. Yes. So these rulers of darkness in these people, you see, they would not have it. They're the ones. That the, he, it's Satan that hates Jesus. It's yes. Satan that is using man. You see, Satan wants to be man. Satan wants to operate through man. He's a spirit, just like God the right. Father is spirit. Satan is a spirit, and he needs human flesh and blood to operate through. So you see, behind the veil of their flesh was Satan himself coming against Jesus. He was not going to have. You see, he tried to, to, to kill the bloodline all the way through history. It was a miracle that, right. that the Son of God could, could, could come and be the legal one that would take David's throne. It was, a, it was absolutely a miracle because on every turn, Satan was after destroying the bloodline that would come, that would be the Savior, the one that was, that, that was going to take his place, really, and really bring salvation to us. That's why he hates us. Yes. He hates us. You know, Jesus calls us the light of the world. Well, his name, Lucifer, means light bearer. So we've taken his place. We're the true light of the world now. And he's the devil. And he hates. he's the one that hates us. And actually, he's the one that accuses you before the Father day and night. He's the one that we, we're to do with, not right. flesh and blood. So we've just exposed... What's behind all the <laughs> the the um, clerical garbs and garments of religion, and we've 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 exposed the source. That's why Jesus met with vitriolic hatred. No telling, just like Sylvia said, and the scriptures testify to it. You could read the accounts. How many assassination? attempts, even before Jesus was born, trying to snuff out the light of the world that would come through humankind, through man. Satan did not like this, and try as he might, he tried to extinguish the light before it even got turned on. Well, Richard, let me read right in Genesis what God promised. And we've read this often, mm. but it should be read again. Because when man fell, and you know, when there was the blame game and all that, but actually it came down to being Satan was the real yes. enemy. Yes. The real enemy of mankind was Satan. And this is what God promised right in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 15, Oh boy! it says this, And I will put enmity between thee, he's talking to Satan, and the woman, and between the seed of her, her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Right. So his, his seed of the woman is a his, is Christ, was Christ. Right. You see, and so actually he did that at Calvary. Yes. Because Satan actually, yes. and it says of Judas in a, one of the Gospels that he raised up his heel against Jesus. You see? Yes. Now that Satan raising up his heel against yes. Jesus, putting him on the cross, but what happened at the cross was that Jesus had the final victory because he was made sin on our behalf. Mm that we might be made the righteousness of Christ. Glory. So, hallelujah. Mm. So we can, we're just about finished. So you have All a final right. word, maybe? Glory to God in the highest. And we just hope and pray that you, you hear these words and eat this word that we share with you, for it's from the Spirit of God, just like the Spirit would want you to hear it. So, blessings to you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Sharon. And this is a comfortable chair that you sit in to do these. So, we just praise God and... I thank God for you too, Richard. Thank you for Amen. the word thank that you, you gave Richard. us today. 
we shall speak of these things again next week. Yes, we will. And I think we're in the next chapter in John. Maybe read ahead. We're moving along. Yes. So, all right. Good evening. Bless you all. God bless you all. And come join us again next Sunday. Bye.